Hi guys, I wanted to take a few minutes to go over project 11. This is uh, a project about the Fourier series and Fourier analysis. There's a lot of different ways to come at this, so I'm, I'm just going to pick uh, the most straightforward I can think of, and that is to treat it as a, a problem in superposition. So um, here's the setup. So suppose we have a, a, a plucked string. So that's a string where you uh, pluck it in the middle and let go. So uh, this is similar, if you'll think back to the problem on coupled oscillators, to the situation where we set the, set the masses up in a particular displacement and then release them, um, and they would oscillate in some complicated way. But um, in the analysis of a pluck string, it turns out it's convenient to expand, to think of the shape of the string as a superposition of eigenvectors in the same way that it's convenient to think of the initial displacement of the masses in the coupled oscillator problem as a superposition of eigenvectors. It turns out the eigenvectors that we're going to be dealing with this time are uh, sine and cosine functions. If you, here's, here's how you think about it. If it, you guys did a three masses and you ended up with three eigenvectors, what if we went to four or five or six or eight or 27 or 192? If we had 192 masses, there would be 192 eigenvectors, and the eigenvectors consist of a distribution of displacements of each of those 192 masses. Well, if you look at it from a distance, th th that set of displacements is going to start to look like a function of x, because as you, the, the displacement varies as you go down the chain of masses. And so in a limit of very large number of masses, you start to approach a very large number of eigenvectors, and the eigenvectors start to look like functions. The Fourier series is just the natural limit that you get if you in increase the number of masses to infinity. You'd get <coughs> an infinite number of masses stretched out along some length, and uh, now notice that uh, in real life, of course, the string is going to be made of atoms, and so the number of masses is actually going to be finite. But Analytically, it's convenient to just assume that the number goes to infinity and think of each of the masses as in infinitely small. So you have an infinite number of infinitely small masses all s piled along the string, and it turns out it makes the math a lot easier. So s the eigenvectors we're going to be talking about are the sine functions, and you can also use the cosine functions, although in this case, because we're tying the string down at the, this end and we're tying it down at that end, Cosine functions don't contribute to any functions that go to zero at the ends because cosine doesn't do that. So cosine is one at one end and either plus one or minus one at the other end. So it turns out the cosines don't contribute to this particular shape of function, but they could in principle if you had a different shape. Anyway, the idea is you define these eigenvectors in this particular way. So the b sub n's are going to be the eigenvectors that correspond to the sine functions. But I'm not just doing any sine function. It's only sine functions that are in, that have a, uh, a a wavelength that is an integer multiple of the size of the uh, string. So that is, the string goes from one end to the other, from here to here, <coughs> from here to here, and it has to go through an integer number of half wavelengths between those two points, and that is ensured by this condition here, that the I have an integer number of pi x over l. When x is equal to l, that means the sine goes through an integer number of pi uh, in terms of phase. So the n equals 1 case would be 1 pi. n equals 2 is this orange. That would be 2 pi from here to here, and so on. So uh, these are the sine functions that start at zero and end at zero in a finite length of the string. Okay, And why is this crazy square root of 2 over L here? Well, it turns out we want to make these guys in such a way that when I take the dot product of one basis function with itself, I get 1. So this is a normalization factor that ensures that these are normalized basis functions. So, And the idea is that we're going to define uh, the dot product. Here we go. I'm going to define the, the dot product of two basis functions as this guy right here. It's the integral of one basis times the other basis integrated over the full length of the string. Notice that that is simply the natural extension of the conventional notion of a dot product to a continuous 
uh, basis. So the idea is if, if it were three masses, it would be the displacement of mass 1 times the displacement of mass 1 plus the displacement of mass 2 in one basis times the displacement of mass 2 in the other basis plus, th that's a regular dot product, right? It's, th it's the one component times the one component plus the two component times the two component plus the three component times the three component. This is the same idea except applied to a continuous basis. So the idea is these, got these basis functions turn out to be orthonormal. If I multiply one of these basis functions by any of the others and integrate over the full uh, length of the string, I get zero. Unless I multiply a basis function by itself, in which case I get one. So the basis functions, just like unit vectors in three-dimensional space, the, I, the x unit vector, the y unit vector, and the z unit vector, if I dot them into one another, I get zero. But if I dot them into themselves, I get one. So these guys have exactly that same behavior. Um, anyway, the idea is that you can write any function as a superposition of basis functions. So I, I, b1, b2, b3, b4, these are all these different sine functions. The claim is that any function that satisfies these boundary conditions, I can write it as a superposition of these basis functions. Then the question is, what are these c's? c1, c2, c3, and so on. Well, the idea is to figure that out. As I multiply this whole equation by one of the basis functions, say b sub m, and I integrate. Now notice that on the right-hand side, I'm going to get bm times b1, or bm times b2, or bm times b3. Only one of these integrals is actually going to be non-zero, and that's the one where m is equal to the integer here under the integral sign. So uh, on the left-hand side, I've got bm times f. Well, f is this function, so I'm going to multiply the mth basis function by the shape of the string and integrate that. And that will come out to be a number that depends on m, okay? Um, I can also use Dirac notation to, to uh, write the same thing. Dirac notation is just a, a simplified version. Notice this, this notation corresponds to this integral. This notation corresponds to that integral and so on. But you can see here that when I, when I write it this way, it's easy to see what's going on. Only one of these terms in the sum is going to count, and that's the one where n is equal to m. When n is equal to m, of course, I get 1. So that means this whole sum on the right-hand side is just equal to c sub m. So that's what this statement is saying. And so c sub m, you can see if that's on the right-hand side, it's c sub m. On the left-hand side, what is it? Well, it's m on f. So it's the integral of b sub m on f. So one of the reasons we normalize these wave functions this way is to make this math to, to avoid the clutter that would otherwise show up in this math. This gives you a very simple way to calculate uh, the mth coefficient. And for this particular example, <coughs> taking this function multiplied by this set of basis, uh, this turns out to be the result. So I go ahead and work out that integral here. Now your job for this project is to do exactly the same thing but simply pick out a different function. So pick your own function, I don't care what it is, um, and evaluate the coefficients analytically. So you're going to basically uh, do the same bit of calculus, except instead of using my function, you'll use your function. Does that make sense? Um, I would pick a function that's symmetric, so you can exploit the symmetry of the signs and the symmetry of your function. And that's exactly what I did here in the integral. I noticed that uh, because f of x is symmetric, I can just calculate the integral from 0 to L over 2 and multiply by 2, and I get the same thing. So uh, that's the idea. Actually, well, it's not, it's not quite that simple. If, if m is odd, that's true. If m is even, like this one, m equals 1, uh, in that case I get 0 because the sine function is anti-symmetric, with respect to the midpoint, the function is symmetric, and so you're definitely going to get zero. So that's why the c's in this example only include the odd c's. The even c's are zero. So, and you can see that in the in the list down here. There's a th calculated coefficient. There's a theoretical coefficient. How am I getting the calculated coefficient? Well, I'm calling this crazy uh, what is it? Um, Braquette function braquette function. The braquette function simply calls the Simpson integrator and calculates the integral of the nth basis function with the uh, function. 
that that we're representing. And so this is just a brute force numerical calculation of the coefficient. <clears throat> just to check your math, you can compare that to your analytical. So you'll get a different this, this is my answer for the C sub n's. When you change the function, you'll get a different answer for your C sub n's. You'll get a different expression. But it'll just depend on whatever function you happen to choose. Anyway, you can see here when you add these guys up, this graph is showing you how this is the n equals 1 term, and then there's adding in the n equals 3, the n equals 5, and so on. You keep adding those up, and the sum of those sine functions is approaching ever more closely the original uh, function, which was this one. So anyway, I hope that helps. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions.